Good morning, everyone, if you're joining us from the East Coast, and good evening if you're joining us from further afield. My name is Sarah Dorr. I am ISA's Director of Professional Development. And today um, I am here to introduce you to our very first Situation Room on the Ukraine-Russia War. This event is co-sponsored by CISA and ISA's Global International Relations section. So just a few pointers for today in terms of um, management. If any of the audience members would like to ask a question, they can put it in the chat or they can raise their hand. Depending on the volume of questions that we receive, we'll, we'll bounce back and forth between the two of them. Um, and I think that's it. I think we're about to get started. I will turn um, the, the microphone over to Vendulka. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome on behalf of the International Studies Association and particularly the Global uh, International Relations Section, which was uh, very recently established. It's the youngest section of the International Studies Association. Um, what do we do? Why do we actually call our situation boom? It is a little bit arrogant, you might argue, uh, because what can we possibly do in the, the circumstances of the, the, the war, which is now at the stage of an attrition war. Uh, and uh, I have got to explain why, why we actually feel that we had to do a situation room. Uh, the war started in February, uh, we were established in March, and we promised that we were going to actually bring together different cultures, religions, civilizations, exploring how different narratives describe and influence major world crises. Uh, and for that end, uh, you would hear not simply one worldview posing as universal, but different narratives on contemporary global crises. And of course, this major crisis, we just could not miss, although we realize how terribly difficult it is actually to make any contribution. Uh, first of all, uh, how can we use the term situation room? Well, first of all, we are not Wolf Blitzer, situation room of CNN every day. Nor are we actually pretend to do a situation room such as uh, the White House has. But most importantly also, uh, we uh, you know, are not trying to compete with another situation room, which is the National Center for Administration of uh, Defense Forces. And this is very important for you to, to, to show. Who is not allowed into the situation room in Russia? Uh, the, the lineage of the Matryoshka dolls, which I'm sure that you have heard if you visited Moscow, is banned. Uh, and instead, we have got now, if there is a Matryoshka, it's one Matryoshka, it's Putin. And if you open that Matryoshka, it's, it's Putin again. Uh, so the Matryoshka dolls are, are not really a very good metaphor now because uh, Putin sees himself in, in a lineage of other Matryoshkas, namely the, the uh, Tsars, the Russian Tsars going all the way back to 17th century, uh, trying to uh, re, uh, revisit the uh, Russian glory. Uh, and uh, for that, uh, you know, also in in uh, his entourage, there are three, two very important people, a uh, Russian patriarch, uh, Kirill, and also a, a, a political theorist, philosopher, Alexander Dugin, who was almost assassinated. Unfortunately, his, his daughter, I'm not saying unfortunately, but she became the victim of the mistaken identity. So this is really the playbook of the situation room. Uh, which we obviously cannot match in, uh, or we are not in fact going to dwell uh, in all, all of that. Uh, so what do we really do? What can we do? We just sit around the table here uh, and uh, try to do as we promised, uh, put into the things which have been missing, uh, which should perhaps uh, lead to some lessons which we should take seriously uh, in other crises. So uh, yes, we start also with the Russian crisis and it is important to start with a map to 
realize the magnitude of the issue, that, that uh, the, the gigantic territorial Russia as against uh, European uh, part. Uh, and of course, the entire uh, Europe is very badly hit by everything as uh, 6 million displaced people and so on and so forth. But uh, we actually prefer to, or we will start with the state-centric perspective. How you see the, the sovereign states uh, rotating around, uh, but we would rather, true to, to the promise of the GIRS, we prefer to look at the world without the states because we do not know uh, what will emerge uh, after this crisis, how the world, how the, how the alignments of power, economy or whatever will shape up. Uh, and uh, with that, I want to uh, introduce uh, the, the panelists. Uh, first of all, uh, the members of the GIRS, which is Professor Bistek and Professor Bahera, uh, from Geneva and New Delhi, respectively, and also somebody who is our own, and that is Professor, uh, Professor Chao Ming from, from New Zealand, then uh, Professor Soroka, uh, from Harvard. Uh, then we have got uh, Jocelyn, uh, Jocelyn Suzari, uh, chair of the section on religion and an ex expert on not just Islam, but uh, world religions. Then we have got here, uh, and this is deserving of a drum roll, uh, Professor Shipping Tang, who, who is uh, number one, I am told by my colleagues at the university here, number one in uh, China a scholar, Xi Pingtang from Fudan University. But more drum rolls here for, for Maria, who is the president of the CESA. She is a uh, Estonian, uh, but based in Copenhagen. And we are not done with the drum rolls. So there is Professor Siba uh, Grovogui, uh, who, whose work will be published, I believe. And uh, I got a pre-publication text and I could not put it down because I found it absolutely Fascinating, and to that also uh, Professor uh, Molloy contributed, who also agreed to join because he's a political philosopher, and we will have to uh, we will have to broach uh, his territory as well. So uh, this is what we are. Uh, we sit around the table, and I should not uh, leave us out of it. Your hosts, uh, there is Renat Shakutinov. He is at Florida. Atlantic University, and he is a um, Russian minority. He is a Russian Tatar. Uh, and uh, I feel his pain because um, his family is in Russia. He has got Russian passport. It makes it very, very difficult. Uh, but, but he uh, monitors uh, very carefully uh, what is going on also on the academic front in the study of international relations in, in Russia, which is uh, often omitted out of our consideration. And as far as I'm concerned, I have been uh, all of my life uh, obsessed about uh, having bias. And now we have got actually a, a, uh, a section which is actually not punishing people for having a bias. I come from a communist country uh, un involuntarily. I was, uh, you know, I defected as a, uh, a KGB spy when I was a young kid. And have been really wondering uh, all of my life, uh, reading a great deal, Said and others about the pain of being in exile. Uh, anyway, so this is essentially the crew, and uh, the the deal will be, uh, and I think it it you know you can alter it as we go along, that we will actually handle, accept uh, you know aspects of, of the crisis, one after the other, uh, with the possibility that uh, we single out a couple of you or three of you uh, to lead the discussion and others can chime in, then we will go to the second group and the third. So it will be much more, much more energetic than the regular round table where people just speak 10 minutes and uh, that's it. We will try to interact. So with that said, 
let me just add to it one little thing. One of the first issues will be what type of a configuration might emerge. And we have got people, Fukuyama was, for instance, interviewed in Czech media, uh, that he thinks that the, that the Pax Americana, the end of history, and uh, the, the, the uh, neoliberal world order will continue. It has got a little difficult part, but it will be back in business. There are other people who, uh, you know, revisit Huntington civilizations, albeit they are critical of, of the essentialists' uh, way the, the uh, civilizations were actually uh, de delineated. Or you have got also the division between the Global North and Global South, where we have got uh, Professor Malso, uh, who um, writes uh, marvelous stuff about uh, seeing in the current war uh, the chapter in decolonization of the world. In other words, the global East from which Renat and I come from are now uh, being decolonized. So the, the, you know, the fixed uh, boundary between the global North and global South uh, uh, has got to be revisited. Uh, and then, then you know, we have got the history of the brick, which is uh, bricks rather, uh, which might be altered in so far as the role of China, which is very much adding to the mix. And um, most importantly also, and for that we have got several experts here, is the recognition of the importance of religion, which was something taboo for the political science, uh, because, uh, you know, uh, ideologies, religions, and so on are for, for Sunday school, but they do not play a role uh, within the canon of positivist or neo-positivist social scientific thought. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, I want to also remind us that what is being challenged is the West-centric lens, which we, particularly in the United States and Western Europe, uh, still uh, use for looking at the world, not recognizing that, that the West itself is shrinking very much. Uh, the projections are that uh, people who live in the West are, are, you know, becoming a very, very small part of the humanity, and therefore we have got to, we in the West have got to, uh, uh, you know, somehow uh, clear up our lens. Uh, and, um, you know, the question then also is, what is the West? Because, you know, now we lost the sight of how it actually uh, came about. I uh, use uh, the, uh, the best book, French book by uh, Philippe Nemo, uh, who, who actually explained it, but I don't think many people agree with it. So uh, the final question is, have we missed anything? Have we missed something which we have missed when the, the, the Cold War was ending? Uh, we also missed uh, the fact that the, the, uh, the invasion took place, uh, despite the fact that Putin was telegraphing it for the last 12 years, at least. Last summer, he spoke about it and the day before the invasion, and we uh, ignored it because his is an ideology, ours is a theory. And for that, we have got political theorists see, who have got to somehow, and I call particularly on Professor Malloy, uh, yeah, Professor Cesari, and the others uh, to, to actually uh, you know, explain the problem which we have when we actually abandon the positivist parameters and include other narratives, which is our uh, commitment as a, a GIIS. So thank you and let's begin. So I would like to, I may, I would like to call on, on uh, uh, I think I had a list that I wanted uh, uh, Professor Birstek to, to, to start us, uh, followed then by Professor Behera and uh, keep, uh, you know, the experts on religion and um, and uh, the political philosopher, uh, Professor Molloy. So over to you, uh, Tom, unless you don't want to speak just now. No, I'm, I'm fine. I'm uh, going back to, thank you very much uh, for organizing this on behalf of the, uh, the new global IR section, which I am very pleased to co-chair with, uh, with Menduka. And uh, I'm glad to see a number of our other officers and, and, uh, and members joining us for this uh, inaugural event on this uh, very important subject. I'm going back to, uh, I'm speaking today, speaking of global IR, I'm not representing 
Switzerland or the United States. Uh, I'm actually sitting in, in Doha in Qatar where I just gave a lecture. Uh, so but I want to go back to uh, a, a point that you made in your earlier email to us, uh, Vendoka and Renat, about um, how to begin to think about um, this situation room and this situation in the spirit of, of global international relations. So in the spirit of the way, I'm not trying to represent anyone. I'm, I'll give my views on the situation. And I'll begin with the spirit of the way in which I approach global IR. And that is, um, I argue that it's often, it's important to at least attempt to look at the conflict from multiple perspectives. And in this case, I think it's important to try to look at the conflict from the Russian perspective. This may be controversial in many circles in the West today, but I think it's important to make the effort. And I, I will begin by saying, I think Russia does have some justifiable security concerns associated with the expansion of NATO, even though I believe NATO is fundamentally a defensive alliance. And the former Soviet leadership in 1990 did not expect NATO to continue to exist after the end of the Cold War. Some recent documents that have been released from that period have indicated that, particularly after the Soviet Union decided to dismantle the Warsaw Pact. Yet NATO expansion continued to pace in the 90s and early 2000s, not entirely by the design of Washington and Brussels, as some have argued, but largely, in my view, in response to the demands from former Warsaw Pact members themselves, based on their historical experiences with Russia. Now, by saying this, I'm not endorsing John Mearsheimer's consistent, but in my view, rather narrow interpretation of the origins of the conflict. And this is because, in my view, Vladimir Putin is more threatened by the ideas of world order associated with Europe and by revanchist nostalgia for greater Russia than he is with NATO expansion. That being said, it's also true that Russian minority populations have been discriminated against through language and citizenship policies in a number of former Soviet states, including Ukraine, but also the Baltic republics. But neither of these situations, the NATO expansion or the treatment of Russian minority populations adequately explains, or in my view, justifies why Russia invaded Ukraine with the original intent of not only replacing its government, but ultimately in eliminating the nation state through annexation of all or major portions of its territory and erasing the separate Ukrainian identity. In my view, the military expansion of a sovereign state with security guarantees from Russia itself is completely disproportionate to the security concerns expressed by Russia. And this is indeed only the second time since the end of World War II that a state has invaded another internationally recognized sovereign state with the declared intention of annexing all or part of its territory. The first, obviously, was the uh, Iraq invasion of Kuwait in 1990. So the invasion not only violates the 1994 Budapest Memorandum on Security Guarantees. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm uh, hearing something that I'm not seeing. So I guess I may have gone over my time. So let, let, me, let me stop with that. It not only violates the Budapest Memorandum, but also Article 2 of the UN Charter. And this is why I think there's been such a strong reaction from Europe, the US, and other G7 states uh, like Japan and Canada. But let me stop at this point. Thank you. Before we go any further, I just want to I want to, to say that that's why I've taken the time in the introductory uh, piece uh, that um, Putin plays from a different playbook. You know, the framing of his worldview is very different. You know, where he regards the international law and all of the concepts of sovereignty and so on as as uh, you know the figment of uh, a Western. Uh, imagination, and uh, he is not the only one, you know, I look forward to hearing also from uh, our Chinese colleagues, but uh, I think we had also, um, you know, unless unless uh, somebody else wants to continue, uh, immediately we asked Professor Behera, and that because she wrote about the creation of knowledge, uh, so is she there, can she, can she actually uh, say, because, you know, the major issue which we have got before us is is uh, you know can we actually take uh, the view of the of the uh, Russians uh, as a narrative which um, has a place in our consideration of what's going on? Not just the straitjacket you could argue, much as though we live in it, of the international law and the Geneva Conventions and all of that. So over to whoever wants to take the baton. Um, thank you, uh, Vindulka. Um, thank you, Renat, uh, for um, organizing this uh, um, on behalf of our section and collaborating 
as for the subject at hand, you know, I find that very intriguing that, uh, uh, I mean, first of all, I, I could just say that this confirms what I have been arguing for a while that IR theories don't necessarily explain what's going on around the world. Uh, and uh, we need different uh, ways of understanding uh, uh, the world and the way the world works. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the frames of theories and I mean, if we got the first shot with the disintegration of Soviet Union, it's um, telling uh, that uh, the Loki is another one, Ukraine, uh, 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 a war, which kind of makes us or opens a window for us to actually re-look at wider knowledge frames of IR and as to how inadequate and uh, poorly fit uh, I find them uh, in, in terms of understanding uh, you know, sort of what the world is um, out there. And uh, the one lesson that I can share is that there is actually no single template. There is no single set of either epistemic frames or, uh, you know, methods uh, uh, that uh, would offer to us a sort of a complete picture of what really is unfolding uh, uh, in the in the Russia-Ukraine uh, uh, war. And it's not just you know what uh, uh, Tom was talking about is what's happening in the ground zero. What's what's Russia's thinking? What is Ukraine's thinking? So that's definitely one uh, way to understand is that what is going on in the ground zero? How are they looking at the world? Whether it's a question of uh, understanding their own histories, uh, their you know sort of uh, philosophies, their lived practices, but even if you were to look at the world around as to how the world is reacting uh, to the Russia-Ukraine war, again, I find no single frame fits. Uh, uh, you know, uh, when Nulka shared some screens and uh, some of us, including myself, we use these categories, global north, global south, and so on and so forth, I find that the Russia-Ukraine war offers a very helpful vantage point to actually complicate what we've been saying for a while that there is no singular global north and there is no singular global south either. Uh, uh, there are layers within layers, uh, 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 you know, uh, within the region, whether you take Asia or you take Africa or you take Latin America. And uh, even in case of individual countries, uh, I mean, I'm sitting in India and I can tell you New Delhi is uh, navigating it very carefully. It's like a, almost a delicate balancing exercise that they're doing, whether it's to match their energy needs or to look at the wider geopolitical considerations or whether it is to, uh, you know, their more immediate uh, issue of even arms sales, uh, India specific, but nonetheless very important for India. So the point is that, are we willing to open up our knowledge frames to question the very basics, to question the very foundational assumptions of how we think the world works and uh, uh, start sort of, uh, uh, you know, sitting in process of churning motion. Uh, this war to my mind opens up a door uh, uh, to our scholars that I think if we don't take up this opportunity, we would be really missing a very, very critical, uh, uh, you know, doorway that's open to us uh, uh, to see. Uh, in terms of the specifics of what it means for the alignments, I think I'll come back later. But uh, I would, uh, I would just stop here for now and uh, let the fellow panelists come in, and one can always come back later. Thank you. Okay. Well, can I can I uh, jump straight away to to the question of religion? Religion has returned from exile, as one of the first books on the. Uh, topic stated, and I would like to uh, to you know whatever order we have uh, stipulated. I would like to ask the chair of the religion section, uh, Professor Cesare, uh, because her project I understand is now the role of world religions in world politics. What challenges do we have uh, as uh, International Studies Association uh, members who are very much dominated by the positivist and neo-positivist type of uh, political philosophy, which is actually making it very difficult to take religions seriously. Um, thank you, Vandulka, and thank you, Renat, and um, thank you for this wonderful discussion right on uh, current events. So to respond to your question, Vandulka, I would like to provide um, 
a possibility to look at religion and international affairs that I have just developed in my new book, We God's People, looking at Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, and how they um, appear on the international scene. <clears throat> and for, for this, the premise is that we don't look at religion as ideas only, we look at religious tradition in all their materiality, institutionality, and how they have interacted with the nation as a modern political community. Without the nation state, there is no international system, if I can say this bluntly. And we have not paid attention enough to the fact that because of this secular bias to just mention, Van Luka, that religious tradition during all the phases of nation building have been deeply reshaped by the necessity to adjust to the international to the national framework. So in my book, I have a special special cases, and one is indeed orthodoxy and Russia. And, and so what does it mean to look at this um, politization of religion and vice versa through this angle. It means that if you look historically, there has always been a tension between the center of the political power and the orthodox center. And this is foundational to the modernity of Russia. And at the same time, there is a tension between the political power and all the ethnic linguistic peripheries. And what, again, what we don't see if, if we just choose our Western lenses is that actually the modernization process in, uh, in Russia, so something that is uh, unthinkable from the Western point of view, Russia was at the same time a colonial, a colonial power, but also a colonized series of territories. And, and you understand this once you take the pain to look at what has been the ongoing debate and changes in institution since you started Peter the Great and Catherine the Great, and you see how the tension has always been between nation and empire. It never ends. And in some ways, the Putin uh, era is another expression of that, because the tension is always between how do we manage the differences, but at the same time, how do we create a sense of sameness for the collectivity, the modern collectivity that we call now Russia. And um, again, if we look at patterns, and I have to say in the book, it was published before the war, I, I, I do not forecast the war, but I use the pattern to show that there will be an expansion of Russia based on the Orthodox community. So what does it mean? It means that if you look at the tension, you have Rusiski or Sovietsky versus Ruski. So you mean you, you can see the patterns where the Rusiski, meaning the state, the ideology, or Sovietsky, it was the same thing, is either competing, clashing, cooperating with Ruski as the religious, ethno, linguistic identity of Russia. And what is interesting and what I show in the book is that orthodoxy today is both on the side of Rossiski because Putin used it internationally through different state institutions, but orthodoxy as a global religious community is also on the Ruski side, on the ethno-religious uh, dimension. And what you see is how the interest of the Russian Orthodox Church as a leader of global orthodoxy either compete sometimes, but here in this particular case in Ukraine, converge with the geopolitical um, vision of, of, um, of Putin. And, and that's, I think, a way to look at religion differently and I will sh sh shut up right now, just wrap up. One thing, we cannot understand religion in international politics if we do not reintroduce history. And here I would like to make a special claim on the unhistorical turn of international relations. And it doesn't mean we have to become historian. For this work, I didn't do historian work. I used the work of historian, which is different. Second, we always look at religion and ideal as ideology influencing 
concrete material institution, we have to look at the interaction. I show in my work that concrete material political institutional realities influence religious ideas, identification, and behavior. So once we look at the continuous interaction, we cannot posit this understanding in one school or another. And that's why I understand that it may not be receivable to lots of the trend gatekeeper, but that's why I like the fact that the global religious or global uh, <laughs> uh, identity or global politics and religion is here. Uh, and thank you, Vendulka. Uh, well, well, this is just terrific. And I uh, normally I would just jump straight away onto Maria uh, Mal Malzo, who actually uh, you know published a, a great deal about the the memory, uh, which ties very closely with what uh, Jocelyn said. And I would like to say that uh, that uh, Sarah, you know, on behalf of the organization of, of the, these webinars, that we will have an opportunity actually to make a reading list, uh, you know, which would supplement uh, the YouTube as it as it fly, will fly. But we now have got to change the, the, the order of March because we understand that shipping tank uh, has got to leave in uh, uh, in uh, 15 minutes or something like that. Uh, and therefore, you know, whatever he he wants to say on this topic, I think we, you know, have got to really uh, hear him. I was reminded several times by Amita Pacharaya uh, that Shipping Town predicted, uh, predicted the, the conflict, although, you know, some, some of us also felt it in our bones because we read Putin, those of us who read Putin, uh, felt that something will happen. Uh, but, uh, you know, if uh, sh Shipping Tang would also tell us uh, something which I'm fascinated by, uh, the idea, the Chinese idea of the world order, uh, or whatever which my Chinese students uh, taught me, uh, you know, the hierarchical understanding of the world, which is different from the anarchical uh, system which West has uh, invented and spread across the world. So whatever you want to say, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much, Chair. Uh, uh, I'm sorry I have to leave uh, in about 15 minutes. So, uh, well, I start with Tianxia. I'm not a fan of Tianxia. I don't think the, most of the Chinese thinkers or scholars are really uh, more about the notion of Tianxia. There are some philosophers, but then most of them are not really are scholars per se. Uh, well, so I come back to the Ukraine war, right? So uh, fundamentally speaking, I think the Ukraine war, the Russia invasion of Ukraine uh, can be somewhat described as a tragedy of great power politics. So although I actually disagree with uh, John Meshkan quite a bit, on this particular front, I think uh, he and I agree on particular one thing. I think this war was preventable. Uh, so actually, I wrote a short piece in 2009, shortly after the uh, Georgia crisis, and I predicted that the Ukraine will be the next uh, battleground. But unfortunately, uh, I actually sent the piece to quite a few uh, outlets, uh, New York Times, perhaps, I think, um, uh, quite a few. Uh, none of them actually were willing to carry the piece. And eventually, I actually went to the distance. I asked uh, a great mentor, and I was also a great role model for me, uh, Bob Jervis, who actually just passed away uh, last uh, December to actually kind of call right with me, but he declined. So eventually that piece was not really published. But in that piece, I precisely predict that the next uh, crisis will be between Russia and Ukraine because Ukraine will be a divided country because uh, on the Eastern part of Ukraine, many Russian speaking uh, Ukraine uh, nationals or even ethnic uh, Russians, uh, they are perhaps more you know, closer to uh, Russia, or at least have more affinity for Russia. Uh, so in that piece was not really published until 2014. Uh, now back to the uh, this particular war, I use a very simple game theoretical model to predict that Russia will uh, 
invade Ukraine within this, this particular winter. And a very important element of that model is actually there is a very important logic of preventive war behind this particular calculation or Putin's calculation, if we want to put that way. So Putin, in a way, was really reading the situation into the future, let's say 10 or 15 years uh, later on, Ukraine will, be, will become a de facto NATO state. Well, be a NATO state by name, but it will be a de facto NATO state because uh, NATO has been arming uh, Ukraine. None of this, I'm not really condoling uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, but I see this as a particular tragedy for European, uh, Ukraine people, but also the Ukraine uh, uh, situation, but also for the whole uh, European security. So for me, I'm not really a Russian or Ukraine expert. What I'm really interested in is really see, uh, according to my kind of a social evolution of international politics, Putin, of course, will be punished by the uh, more defensive kind of realist uh, system we are now having today. But unfortunately, leaders like Putin can, you know, come up with certain ideas in pushing for certain uh, behaviors. But this has been, I would put it that way, a preventable war in the sense if the United States or NATO, or even I would actually put more blame on France and Germany, they should have done far more to prevent this particular tragedy. But they really did not really stand against Russia, stand against the United States or NATO. And they should have really you know, try hard to get United States or NATO with Putin together and talk about the situation in Ukraine. But unfortunately, they never did. So they actually kind of a, uh, likely silently or kind of a walk toward this particular war, which the whole European community is paying the price. And unfortunately, I would say this particular war will have a long lasting impact on not only European uh, continent, but also the you know the cross Atlantic's uh, relationship, but also I will because you know uh, U.S. In, is increasingly now or has been increasingly taking China as next uh, target to be uh, contained. It will have a huge and long lasting impact on how the, the world behaves. In particular, how we are going to see the next twenty years or fifteen years of U.S. China relations. So I think we should not really be, uh, we should not really underestimate the impact of this particular crisis and war. It's going to impact uh, at least in our lifetime. So next 10 or 15 years or maybe 20 years, it may become a very long lasting war in particular because Russia is not going to be easily defeated. It may still have certain staying strengths so I think all of us, including our scholars, of course, should be prepared for a fairly long and bloody war. It is going to be a, and I think the eventual post-war settlement will be very crucial. See whether the European countries can get Russia, Ukraine, the United States, and maybe Turkey to sit together and to talk about things and eventually come up with a long lasting and peaceful settlement. All limited wars have to end. So the Korean War ended with a choose. Uh, it, it still doesn't really have a peace uh, accord. And I hope the European countries can be wiser and therefore we can eventually have a peaceful settlement. Whatever the particular uh, sense in the settlement is beyond my kind of understanding, but certainly I hope peace will eventually come back to the European uh, continent. Thank you so much. I'm sorry I have to leave, but yeah, I will you know, a few before, minutes. Before you leave us, I will want to raise two points if I may. Um, you know, there is obviously in, in the United States and you make it clear that also in China, there is a difference between the uh, political pronouncements and the academic uh, views. I, uh, you know, I'm not a China scholar, but I have noticed that the Chancha, which you think the the all under heaven, which is 
which is what uh, you know you said that you have not much time for, which would advocate a sort of hierarchical world order. Uh, that's something which your president of the PRR, PRC is actually talking about. Uh, you know, uh, whether it is just to distance himself from the Western tradition because it is hooking him to, to Confucius and showing that China actually, actually has got its uh, intellectual, uh, cultural, uh, different past. And the other thing I would like to just uh, say that I think that it is important to, to follow what the Chinese say. Uh, yeah, I, I wasted a lot of time following uh, new thinking of Gorbachev. Uh, and Chinese uh, had a completely different view of what new thinking was uh, and what I then published about. Uh, and now that Gorbachev died, uh, you know, we completely ignored the fact that uh, it was not just perestroika and glasnost, it was new thinking. It was a, a scheme for the entire world which failed. Uh, so I just want to say that it is so important for us to actually involve uh, the Chinese youth. Uh, yes, uh, and uh, if you have got to leave, uh, anybody has got a question, but uh, another Chinese colleague of ours from New Zealand indicated that he wants to uh, respond. So uh, Shipping, do you want to okay. say All right, so I, I, let me be uh, fairly brief. Uh, I start with a garbage of question. I think, uh, uh, there is a fairly very important divide, you know, about you know the the role or the kind of legacy of Gorbachev. Uh, I think uh, the majority of the intellectuals, I would say, take Gorbachev to be a great reformer, although most of them would take identify him as a uh, not very successful reformer. But under the kind of propaganda of the uh, the state. Uh, most of the Chinese people think Gorbachev betrayed the socialism, communism, and therefore eventually led to the dismantling of the USSR. USSR. But I would say uh, if an educated Chinese, if, if he or she uh, read at least the minimum of, amount of history, Russia has done far more damage than most of the Western powers to China. And But of course, uh, during the Cold War, uh, China and Russia were allies. So therefore, uh, a long uh, kind of a historical connection has been established between Russia and China. And therefore, it has some impact on regular Chinese folks. Uh, about uh, Tian Xia, I'm, I'm not really sure I uh, fully uh, heard your question. So what I want to argue is, I think uh, President Xi Jinping didn't really use Tian Xia per se. He, he talked about the harmonious world, which can be understood as a dimension of Tian Xia concept. But the Tian Xia thing, let me put this very bluntly, all right? The Tian Xia notion has no popular currency among Chinese intellectuals, especially among Chinese IR scholars. All you guys have heard is about the Chinese philosopher who actually tried to revitalize the Tian Xia concept. There are a few uh, IR scholars who actually uh, you know, discuss the implication of Tian Xia, but most of the Chinese IR scholars or specialists, they don't really take Tian Xia seriously, all right? So uh, I say it with a fairly amount of confidence if if you read some of my writings, I use uh, quite a bit of uh, precise languages. So I don't think Tianxia has been a very important concept in influencing Chinese uh, international behavior or international relations scholarship. All right. Thank you so much. Well, only, you know, since I still have you there, I think, you know, I read it as a sort of a um, denial or a modification of the anarchical principle which the system of state installed. In other words, the world is not uh, anarchical, but it's hierarchical. That's how I understood Tiancha, and I think it's close to reality. Anyway. So oh, if, you, if you talk about that, I can agree. So the, the world actually quite a few hierarchical system, international system or subsystem, right? So let's say in the modern age, so, you know, the British Empire, the American Empire, the Chinese Empire, the pre-modern, you know, Russian Empire, but uh, fundamentally speaking, I think the post-Westphalian system has been a mixture of hierarchical and anarchical system. So 
among regular states, they are more kind of horizontal and anarchical. But you do have, you know, the hegemon like the United States or the United Kingdom or even China before 1840. But those are, I would say, for at least for the Chinese Empire, was a thing of the past. We are now having a quasi imperial system under US, US hegemony, but that's very different from the Tianxia's notion per se, all right? Yeah, <clears throat> terrific. Well, you know, uh, we then will resume somehow, and there are several people to my delight, delight who actually want very anxiously to contribute. Uh, I see uh, Siba Grobogui, uh, also I see the uh, Chinese scholar from New Zealand, I have to so, wave uh, goodbye to everybody. I'm sorry I have to miss most of the discussion. I'm sorry, the, but I hope I have contributed something interesting to all the well, discussion. Well, you certainly have done, and it's a deal that when we have a ne next situation room, you will okay. come again. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank okay. you very bye much. Bye-bye. Yeah. Okay, bye-bye. So over to, uh, I, I, I don't know, you know, I lost now the order of March, uh, but but uh, you know there have been now several questions open and need to to uh, the conversation has got to pick up several uh, several points. So because uh, because uh, uh, Chaoming uh, was anxiously trying to continue where where Xi Pingtang uh, finished, perhaps I will ask you to make a comment on what because you you actually hail from New Zealand, so you are Chinese, uh, but you are uh, not really uh, hailing from uh, People's Republic of China. So over to you. Right, uh, thanks. Uh, you know, it's been uh, 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 it's great to, to follow in the discussion. I think I, I just very simply start given the time we have uh, following uh, Tang's comments on, 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 on Tianxia and, and Chinese perspective. I think the war in Ukraine uh, really had not much to do with what Chinese think or Chinese perspective on these issues. Uh, and I agree with Tang, you know, the Tensha system is really, uh, is a is very Asian way of uh, how people organize state, organize, you know, political polity uh, and how the authority works. Uh, and it's almost like, you know, old days religions and, and, and the civilization, a way of uh, organizing. This is different from modern way we organize state, organize territory, and, and different how do we belong to whom. And this is where I think the war is all come, the Ukrainian war is all about. But to me, it is a lot of large, largely a European problem. And that European problem, uh, went back all the way to, you know, 100 years back to the Westphalia times when, when states want to find a principle in a way to determine how we actually define the boundary of the state and authority of the people over the territory. It's those are modern values that we, we, you know, we hear quite a lot about these things. So territoriality, sovereignty, all these issues very important in the institution that we set up. But the problem I think is these institutions set up that's actually not sufficient enough to deal with more complicated problems in terms of boundary, nation, state, sovereignty, and how do we determine who has the power, who has the authority over this, over this area. The war in Ukraine is a very latest example of this. And people, nation goes to war over these things, right? And so, so, so I, I think it's very important that we, we you know, are always thinking uh, and all kinds of ideas, we, this group want to have a other views, other perspective. And I think I'm always thinking why we need other, other views, why we need other perspectives, uh, because, other perspective can predict these things better. And because the current dominant views, perspective, mainstream views, for the Nuga says, fail to predict, I think there's something that more than that that we need to look into. 
And there's a lot of these perspective, different perspectives are driven by the structural forces, institutional forces at the time. And so the liberal international order that we are speaking with, and we have a lot of issue with a dominant view of American perspective, reflect the, the, the position interests of the, and, and, and the capacity of the United States, the leading political forces that period of time. And what happened now that we're talking about, I, I like the idea of uh, Van Duca says the realignment that reflects the power shift, reflect actually a lot of the uh, polarization of the structure of the international system, which will call for a different perspective to represent, to reflect it, to thinking about how other political forces were thinking about the international relationship should be organized. And so that, that, that's, you know, I work hard to try to connect it. The need for multiple or different perspective and the problem that we are having here, the different crises, each and every one of them, and why we need a particular views. I, I, I found, found, found the early, uh, early talk about religion, international relations. This is very, very good. They're very, very interesting ideas. But you're thinking about what really you thinking, talking about is what is actually a very traditional way of thinking about how we state organize in particular way at that time, in particular. In the case of Ukraine war, it is actually represent a traditional uh, of our, you know, church. And this is in Europe, it's a long history goes back. And so this is all part of that. So we're looking for a different perspective and not necessarily it's different from, you know, the mainstream we would call the liberal views, but actually, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a reflection of, of the different political forces and different, uh, and different positions they have at the time. And so that I think it is very important when we're thinking about global international relations and, and, and I think it, and how they connect with a lot of crisis we are having here. And what I'm thinking is that with the Ukraine war that we are actually moving back to some of the issues that we're thinking about modern value, modern, not the liberal value in international relations in organized the system. Right. Well, you know, now there is a monkey wrench in, in the order of things because I was, planning to uh, very quickly after Jocelyn, I was going to uh, call Maria uh, because uh, she has got so much to say about uh, the uh, role of memory and identity, uh, not to mention the nature of uh, the Ukrainian war as a uh, stage of decolonization process. Uh, there was also also uh, Siba Grovogui, uh, you know, who is another of our guests of honors, uh, Anna, sorry, I am really not torn exactly which way to go. So if Maria can actually hang on for a second, I would like to ask Siba, uh, you know, to, to, to summarize some of the arguments which are so beautifully put in that forum. I could not put it down. It will be published, I believe. I happen to have a pre-publication, uh, you know, collection of his, of his thoughts about uh, the Ukraine, specifically about Ukraine and Russia war. So over to you, please. Thank you. Um, I, I've been listening to a lot of my colleagues and I, I'm, I'm torn as to what direction to go. But I think that I, I um, since you mentioned the forum, I'm going to come to that. I, the forum basically was, I wrote a number of essays that are going to be published by Rabi on his site and a lot of people can see it. I wrote five essays on the Ukraine war on Russia's invasion of Ukraine. I actually call it Russia invasion. And the reason I said that is that um, uh, in the context of the war, a lot of people have been asking about where Africa is because it seemed to be confusing to a lot of people. And what I wanted to say was that, that, that the problem, what is being misunderstood from Africa's position about Ukraine today are two things. One, and it, by Ukrainians and everybody else, that, on the fact, on the face of it, the invasion is condemned by every African country. That's actually reflected in what the Kenyan ambassador said. Um, but where we don't seem to understand 
uh, what we don't seem to understand, obviously, is that, that, that even as Africans may see what is happening in Ukraine today as a war of liberation on the part of Ukraine, which is actually how I see it, that they want, but we actually, that decolonization is pushing too far, as people want to say when they talk to Africans, this is about decolonization. Uh, because decolonization for us had multiple dimension. One of the problems in international politics for us going four centuries back is actually that there is a particular European project of which we have used suspicious. And so the question is, as an African, can I be against Russia's invasion, but not endorse the, the European project behind the reinforcement of NATO's position, which of course may lead to positions against China and all of those things that are happening today. And whether there's a space around U Ukraine war to rethink global security as we try to do after World War II. And I think that that, that for me is, is and a, a lot of people in Africa, you can read African newspapers, some people are cataloging, but what seems to be appearing is that once again, we are missing an opportunity, one, one against we are, missing an opportunity to rethink what a global, a really truly universal global order might look like, and we are back into the European project. And the conflict between uh, Zelensky, even when he was talking to African leaders and, and Eastern Europeans around him who support his vision and who sort of condemn this lukewarm African attitude, whatever they see as either mutism, et cetera, has to do with the fact that um, the, 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 the idea that Ukraine might go join NATO, uh, NATO expansion, and what that implies for the proliferation, proliferation of nuclear weapons of the international system, of the enforcement of the European project, which actually, uh, if I want to use a new concept, emancipatory as people might actually uh, want to pretend that it is. And, and, and I think that that's, that's what was in the essay. And on that score, I actually wanted to, to, to go to, to what uh, uh, Professor Cesari was saying earlier about religion. Right, because I, I thought since I might say this in, in, in a lot of things might come into, into play here, I would actually tag on to, to the idea of religion. Uh, and, and, and obviously like her, I, I don't want to conflate theology with the ecclesia, ecclesiastic law. I don't want to confuse, I don't want to pretend that there is a direct line between political theology and political rationality and political action. But the, the but in international relations since Westphalia and even beyond before, that there is an international view to Western, the Western project of empire and Western foreign policy, therefore, international relations had actually a problem of separation, of seeing Europe as one project and the rest as a separation from it. And if you look at that that way, uh, political, there is a kind of political theology that for us is actually quite troubling. Uh, I don't know if many people realize, but when, when we hear extraterritoriality, for instance, which is what Russia is applying now, which actually comes from Europe, extraterritoriality has a very key, clear connection to grace, the idea of grace, uh, the idea of justification in the re requirement in, in spending new world, even the ideas of indulgences, the, the likeness of indulgences where allies are never wrong, non-allies are always wrong. Uh, uh, and that, if you can tie that to racial rationality and then the security regime that follow, we actually have a lot to say about what the international order is and what is wrong with it. And a lot of it actually has to be in Africa, particularly has to do with reading a kind of particular political theology that gives justification, grace, aligned with justification, grace, and, 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 and indulgences to one side, right? And the same is that other people don't have that. Uh, they don't have uh, national interests, they don't have rationality, they don't have norms, they don't have whatever, and therefore they can only be told to follow. And, 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 and of course, if you don't trust me, the most evident, the most illustrative uh, 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 dimension of it is, is in the US Senate now, they only have one law on Ukraine that has to do with Russian propaganda, is combating Russia propaganda in Africa. Because Africa has always been and thinking and whatever, I can just go down the line. There is, it's called HR 7311 that they passed. Because obviously what is happening in Africa is something that is not comprehensible, but it's not comprehensible because there's actually a long tradition there to which nobody wants to, that nobody wants to hear. Yes, that nobody wants to hear, but that, I, I thank you, I actually, I was going to stop now, but that actually is, is significant to share. And, and I think that what I wanted to plead for, obviously in this context, is to please don't dismiss 
what's happening in, in regional settings as, as Africa uh, simply as sort of either critique or a perspective, but they are actually sites of production of knowledge that are wholly contained within particular theoretical frames, languages, and extra, extra. And that's where I want to stop. Thank you. I'm sorry. I, I <laughs> what I wanted to say, and, and if, if we have got your uh, permission, we would like to also, uh, you know, include it in the, on the site of your, your essays about the, the topic. What struck me was the double standard. Uh, which we which we have that you know we look at Africa, the colonial countries in a completely different way and and you know and uh, this is something which is uh, nowadays unacceptable. Uh, I will jump now at last to Maria because Maria and I think it ties in with uh, what Siba said uh, is actually discussing in published uh, papers discussing what is happening in Ukraine as a uh, current stage of decolonization process. So in other words, Global South uh, is not a complete project uh, because there is now decolonization uh, going on in a, a Global East where Renat and I come from, uh, you know, because uh, there is now post-socialist type of a way of thinking uh, in the sense that, you know, the countries, uh, you, know, the, you know, they are not racially different, but, but they are damaged uh, by what uh, what Foucault called the uh, epistemological violence or whatever that you know we we have got this former Soviet bloc countries which uh, were colonies. I come from a Soviet colony. Anyway, over to you, Maria, please. Thank you very much, Fendulka, and thank you for the opportunity to. Uh co organize this together with the Central and East European International Studies Association. And uh, it's, it's uh, very pertinent that you brought up this epistemological violence, because I think the key questions uh, um, lurking behind what I would describe as the oftentimes confounded debate over the causes of this war, because this debate mixes up the immediate causes and the deeper causes. And I think when we actually sort of start uh, grappling with the deeper causes, then we can't uh, avoid the history of, of imperialism, the history of uh, what is known in Russia's internal colonization as Russia has practiced it. And of course, the mobilizing power of, of historical memory. But epistemological violence uh, comes in when we ask this basic question uh, about, um, you know, who can actually speak and 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 who uh, is listened to and who is heard, and of course, you know, we can talk about many tragedies in world politics. We can talk about the tragedy of great power politics, but we can also talk about the many tragedies of the little security nothing, such as you know these these uh, often uh, objectified. Uh, subjects in in uh, what you call the global east, meaning that uh, they have not been uh, that able to put forward their story or their voices. The very fact that you know Ukraine has effectively been missing from the discipline, which is disproportionate to its size, or the fact that we sort of are all used to actually these narratives that. Um, uh, that effectively have originated from Russia rather than these places themselves. And I think maybe not in the least order, you know, we can we can start also asking questions whether uh, some of these often repeated statements about uh, uh, the discrimination of Russian speaking population in Ukraine and, and the Baltic states is actually not uh, one of them, uh, one of these slightly twisted lenses. But I, I want to say maybe two things uh, in terms of um, in terms of uh, what this war uh, means, right? Somebody asked in the Q and A in our uh, webinar a very pertinent question, actually. That maybe you know, typically for for IR theorists, we are actually spending all that steam on uh, you know weighing our respective theoretical perspectives and 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 positionalities and so on and so forth without actually sufficient uh, regional expertise and and knowledge. And this is one of the main points I think that this war has really brought home that that you can't, uh, you know, certainly not predict, but you can't have a serious understanding of the conflicts of this sort of uh, scale and size without proper area studies uh, knowledge. 
And, um, and this, is really, uh, this is really essential because without understanding the stakes of identity uh, for you know, not just the Putin regime, but perhaps for, for the sort of Russian uh, mind uh, more broadly, um, we simply can't make sense of this war. We can't make sense how is it possible to sell the war to your population by putting you know, into the same breath together the, the ambitions to denazify and to decommunize. Decommun how does it make sense? What are then the real lessons of the Second World War that, that Putin so often speaks about? But I think you know, I, th this trope of the real lessons of the Second World War that Putin actually used as a title of one of his uh, uh, articles uh, written in commemoration of the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II uh, in 2020, uh, is actually really evocative and maybe something that, uh, that actually we should also consider in light of, of uh, our reactions, you know, in the West broadly conceived to the war. Because I think uh, the war has, um, forced us to look into the mirror and forced us to look into the mirror in the way that has caught us off guard. Because usually when we look at the mirror, we prepare ourselves. We, we you know, smile a bit or make ourselves to look nice. But, but when you sort of accidentally get this glimpse, this picture might not be that nice at all. It might be pretty ugly. And I think we see uh, in all sorts of debates going on, you know, public but also academic, uh, pretty apparent readiness to, to trade some of the fundamental principles that were agreed upon, uh, not least, uh, you know, after the uh, Second World War uh, of international law, uh, actually being sort of up for grabs uh, or, or, or negotiated again in order to mitigate the fear of, you know, this conflict somehow further escalating. And of course, you know, in, in the context of memory studies, I'm particularly struck that, you know, we would, we would have this chance that have informed the subfield of memory studies uh, effectively since 1945, which is, uh, you know, about never again, right, never again genocide. And then you have, you know, what we do have. Uh, and have ha uh, witnessed in, uh, in, uh, in Ukraine in terms of really uh, genocidal uh, strategy of, uh, of the Russian forces, which I don't think is incidental at all. Uh, and, and yet, you know, what do we do? I mean, I are, as I are scholars and as a, as a sort of world political system, the UN is toothless and, uh, and we are sort of watching at this through the looking glass. Um, I'd stop here. Uh, we can okay, hopefully well, come back. Well, terrific. And I, you know, really, because we now seem to have only about 20 minutes, uh, uh, you know, I neglected um, a couple of you, we sort of changed the order. But, but uh, you know, Maria said at the very outset that, that there are so many of these Zoom meetings, uh, you know, that it is really that the, 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 the world is overcrowded by the the same types of discussions such as we organized, but I would just point out, uh, just looking at us, that you know, uh, uh, you seldom see people uh, who actually all have got, except one, I think Tom, uh, and we have not heard from uh, George, who are obviously foreigners. <laughs> that, that you know that, that English is a is a second or third language to us, and I think that is the that I think that's, that's the virtue. Uh, and uh, credit to, 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 you know, what we have done. That I, I count that we here around uh, uh, this table, uh, that we actually would claim 15 nationalities because several of us would have several. You see, that I think is a good thing. But over to uh, now, I think, uh, well, Renard was prepared to say something which actually resonates with what uh, Shipping Tang was talking about, the split between the academics and the policy makers, because he, if he uh, will still have time, he would actually cite Russian scholars who actually are, you know, are endorsing a, a power realist uh, sort of views as against the uh, rhetoric and the narrative of, of uh, Putin. But now I want to go to, uh, you know, to Sean, uh, because, uh, you know, he, he contributed to that uh, forum, uh, you know, uh, responded to the, to the essays by uh, Siba Grobogui, and I found particularly interesting, although, you know, he's a political theorist and he may be uh, over, over the head of many of our 
uh, many of our audience, uh, you know, to, to actually enlighten us a little bit about the, the political philosophical problem we have, by what logic can we actually assail positivism? Uh, because that is the premise of the GIRS. And then, uh, then George, who has been patiently waiting, uh, for me is extremely valuable insofar as he wrote about the role of uh, uh, Orthodox Church. Uh, his stuff, I, you know, also I, you know, I think we should we should put online uh, because it was very very insightful how how the uh, the Orthodox Church split into the Russian and Ukrainian and and all of that, which I think is a very very important uh, part of the reasoning uh, of uh, Putin, who never fails to keep crossing himself in the orthodox way, which again, I'm not too surprised by him converting to, to Christianity because, you know, uh, he converts from secular religion, which Marxism was to the uh, Christianity. Uh, so anyway, I uh, would like to ask uh, Sean, we have got 15 minutes left, uh, followed by George Soroka, and I'm sorry that he comes at the very end because he should have probably come first because because I regard the, uh, you know, the uh, religious justification. Some also actually said that, uh, uh, that uh, Putin is waging a holy war, that it is actually to him, it's a holy war where he's trying to save Christianity from the decadent West and all of that. So uh, Professor Malloy and then George. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. I'll keep you as brief as I can. Um, I think where I would begin, if I was asked why is this happening, I'd start with the principle that the war, this current phase of the conflict between Russia and Ukraine, didn't develop in a vacuum. Right? There are you know, deep historical, intellectual, cultural, uh, political, and I think importantly emotional uh, roots to this conflict that we have to examine carefully. Um, I think uh, it's important as well to be maybe a little more critical in how we think about Putin's uh, positioning of himself uh, in Russian history uh, and the political theological dimension of, of the uh, idea of a crusade and these echoes of Tsarist notions of uh, Moscow as the third Rome. They're all very important, but they're all very instrumental as well in the development of a, a position that uh, may not have as deep a root as we like to think. I mean, if we think about the positions taken by uh, Putin in the speeches before the war and his uh, attempt to develop a sort of uh, quasi-Tsarist ideology wherein um, he's playing a, a, a sort of messianic role and, and Russia also plays a messianic role, um, we can go back a little bit further to a different geopolitical context uh, in the early 2000s um, where we can see that uh, the very same Vladimir Putin uh, was reacting very equanimously to uh, the proposal uh, put forward by the Kuchma presidency, often seen as a very pro-Russian Ukrainian presidency in, in Ukraine, uh, to join NATO. And Vladimir Vladimirovich was perfectly fine with this uh, because the circumstances were different uh, and what he wanted to achieve were different and how he wanted to achieve it was different. And I think we have to examine uh, why and how uh, the Russian uh, positionality or positions I should say uh, on this conflict have developed the way they have. And I think when we do that, we have to think in, in historical terms about the end of the Cold War and what Russia thought was going to happen. Um, and I think effectively what we're dealing with here, echoing what I was saying earlier about emotion, is a kind of collective sense of disappointment and disenchantment. Uh, uh, there's a lack of realization of a certain uh, Russian foreign policy dream, which was one of partnership with the West. Like this partnership uh, is perhaps best exemplified by efforts by the Russian Federation uh, to come much closer to NATO in 1994 in Vancouver, for example. Um, now, why did this disenchantment and, and disillusion set in? 
Well, it becomes down to the uh, like a question of power and status. Um, and the kind of key crucial rupture was Kosovo. Uh, Kosovo rewrote uh, the very nature of, of political and legal uh, reality in international relations. And Russia was excluded from this process and took lessons from this process. Uh, and the primary lesson was one of humiliation. And that humiliation then was further uh, exacerbated by the crisis uh, in the currency and the financial crisis in 1998-99 that uh, ultimately led to the, the end of uh, Boris Yeltsin's presidency and the beginning of the, uh, the Yeltsin presidency. And so what we see is um, that there was a period in um, Russian and Western relations that were quite um, amicable, uh, particularly in the wake of 9-11, because you saw after 9-11 a greater rapprochement between R Russian and, and, and Western powers, uh, which is the context in which the Kuchma declaration of a possible membership of NATO for Ukraine is possible. And another rupture uh, was when Russia tried to achieve the same level of status but of the West uh, by employing the principles that emerged in Kosovo uh, in relation to Georgia. And it quickly became evident that this attempt uh, was not going to receive the same reception as the, the war in Kosovo did. And this kind of copper fastened um, the, the rupture uh, between the West and, and Russia, which is effectively based in power. Uh, and Russia's resentment of the power of the West. Uh, and the ideology that we uh, attribute to the current regime is in effect a response to this rupture. Uh, and if we go for deeper causes and deeper causes, I think we can identify this as uh, effectively a, a, an issue about status, power and resentment. Uh, and it's that confection of, of power, status and resentment and the lack of it uh, that gives us a sort of prism by which we can investigate this. And I think Siva's achievement in the forum, uh, of which we're partly discussing here today, is to bring a very shrewd humanism uh, to the analysis of this conflict, which allows us to step outside the uh, ideological lenses that are provided to us by both Russia and the West. I think this is, uh, again, an important element of Martin Kamani's intervention at the UN is to offer an alternative to these ideological lenses, which uh, provides a slight ray of hope that we can reconfigure the world as we reconfigured it at the time of NATO, uh, sorry, NATO's invasion, no, not invasion, uh, uh, operation in Kosovo. We can reconfigure, as Hegel says, ideas have hands, hands and feet, let's put them to work. I'll leave it there. Uh, well, you know, I wrote the last word, and I think it should have been a first word, would be about the, the role of the church. I just want to what comes to my mind that what we have, I think, indicated clearly is that the dicta uh, of international relations theories, uh, in which I was raised, for instance, uh, are now being challenged. Kenneth Waltz, bless his memory, uh, said, pay attention only to what they do, not what they say. That was one thing which I think we show we have got to retire. Also, the, uh, the dictum, leave philosophy to philosophers, leave history to historians, which was the mainstream international relations dictum, and also leave religious uh, beliefs to theologians. And I think these, these uh, you know, three dicta, I think, which are at the, at the, at the uh, core of the new section of international studies, uh, uh, is something which we demonstrate we should abandon. And uh, uh, George, I'm sorry that we left you at the very end, but we will have a second go uh, in Montreal at it because we have got a similar, but with different cast of characters, uh, you know, in Montreal uh, as a regular end table. Um, your work about uh, the, uh, the dynamic of the religious aspect of the of the conversion of Putin uh, to uh, suddenly to, to religion and the split 
of the uh, Russian and Ukraine churches and all of that, I think is a very important aspect, uh, albeit it might be just a justification for Putin to, to you know, elevate himself as, as uh, saving the Russian soul. So over to you. Thank you very much, Vindulka. Thank you to the panelists. The points have been uh, great that have been raised, and uh, I especially resonated with Maria's point about regional studies and the point that Sean just made about status and power. I think this is really important to keep in mind because even, uh, Vindulka, as you said, even if it was just a justification for something else, I think the very fact that we're talking about history, which I've also written a lot about, uh, more actually than on religion, but just the fact that we're talking about it says something about what the people in power perceive the relevance of this to be. In other words, if it's ex post or ex ante to decision making is not really in my mind so material. It's the fact that we're having this rhetoric appear on the world stage at all. Um, you know, I, I think in the West, we've had a very simplistic view of Russia and this has to do with um, the downplaying of regional studies, at least in the United States Academy. Uh, I, I'm, I'm rather allergic to all these stories of, of talking about uh, Dugin as Putin's brain. I, I, I don't think that that's, that's a fair characterization. I don't think he holds as much uh, sway as many in the West do. But we don't study people like Ivan Yelin or more recently, uh, somebody like uh, uh, Vladislav Serkov, uh, who are really more so than Dugin, I, I think, key actors in informing what's going on with Putin. So, so look, I, I think the, the takeaways we can take here is uh, from here is that in Russia, we have to make a divide between religion and culture. In other words, uh, what I mean by this is actual lived belief versus religion as a cultural identity. If you ask Russians, do you identify as Orthodox? Survey after survey shows well over 70% say they do. If you look at actual practices, they're far lower. Actual knowledge of religion is far lower. I also don't think it makes much sense to speak of an Orthodox world any longer. I don't think it makes sense to speak of an Orthodox bloc. I know that became popular after Huntington's Clash of Civilizations came out. I was actually uh, a research assistant for Huntington for a while, so I know him fairly well. A lot of respect for him, but uh, I, I think this that book got a lot wrong. Um, and to some degree, this is a self-fulfilling prophecy because it's one of the most popular political science books in Russia, actually. Um, look, so in the four minutes or so, I, I think we need to think of Putin's logic with regard to Ukraine. And I wish we had more time to actually, we kind of focused on Russia, but we're not focusing on Ukrainian thought, which is a, a, a real shame. But let's stay with Russia for the time being. Um, we have to look at two strands. So there's a realist strand and there's also this more ideational strand. And this is really a failure of the IR imaginary, if you will, to somehow reconcile these two strands or at least to have them occupy the same conceptual space, which I think is important. So on the one hand, on, on the more materialist ontological side of the equation, Putin has been signaling what he wants ever since 2007, the Munich Security Conference, uh, even before that, in 2005, he had this famous quote where he said the fall of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical tragedy of the 20th century. We didn't take him seriously. He's been probing uh, the Russo-Georgian War. He even had precedent for this earlier, not under Putin, of course, but with Transnistria and Moldova, right, with, with Crimea. But remember also, there is this symbolic component to it. Now, Putin has visited Mount Athos many times as a pilgrim. Uh, he was seminal, seminal. People do not know this in reconciling the Russian church abroad, which was the uh, white Russian church. Many of the thinkers, uh, leading thinkers of the revolutionary period fled and took up residence in Czechoslovakia, among other places in Karbin, China. He was instrumental in reconciling this church with the Kremlin based church. Uh, the reconciliation happened in 2007. He had a meeting with them uh, with the key figures on the U.S. side of this, where the church actually ended up being based in 2003. Um, so what happens in the meantime, right? Putin built his contract with Russian society, as it were, on this idea of he's going to provide stability as opposed to the Lichia 90s, right? The wild 1990s of Boris Yeltsin. That worked for a time. I'll remind people in the audience that um, Boris Nemtsov, uh, once called Putin the luckiest man in the world, because when he came to power, oil was about $10 a barrel. And as we know, the oil prices went up throughout the, the aughts. It was really, though, in the um, 
beginning of his third term, right after the Bolotnaya protests, so in 2012, where he started to cast about for a different ideology. Uh, people think that this is really related to the um, Euromaidan protests, but remember, the, the price of oil made up 68% of Russia's export GDP in 2013, right? And that, that alternate ideology he seized upon was provided by the church. And I think this is important to talk about. We talk about this idea of the Russian world, but what we don't talk about is this idea has an analog on the theological side of uh, Holy Rus. And this was, ident this this was really um, something that we started to see being um, talked about seriously in the 1990s among church leaders, including Kirill, who was a metropolitan at the time, not, not the leader of the church yet, his patriarch, and also Russian intellectuals. So, so this is not a government project. This is uh, the government actually seizing on what we could consider to be a church project. Um, I find it quite interesting that Putin has used this language of uh, restoring both the status of Russia, but also restoring the dignity of Russian traditions. I'll remind you that in, two, uh, in 2021, the national security strategy that came out actually had a section that talked about the need to protect Russia's spiritual, uh, moral traditions, cultural traditions, and historical memory, which is, which is quite astounding when you think about this sort of document. So Putin has been making these sort of um, pronouncements about the importance of religion uh, for some time now. And uh, this was really evident during the seizure of Crimea when um, he gave this speech in uh, St. George's Hall in the Kremlin. And he talked about how uh, Crimea was the holy place like the Wailing Wall or the Western Wall is for Jews, right? That this is what Crimea is for us. And you see that trend picked up in Syria where the church gave him a lot of support uh, as protecting Christians. I, I know I'm running out of time. I, I would say, there's a lot more that could be said, but if I had to sum up one thing, I think we really should focus on is the transnational dimension of the civilizationalism that Putin has introduced. This I find particularly interesting, this idea of uh, Russia being seen as the savior of Christian civilization, which is why I made in the beginning of my talk, this division between religion as culture, religion as belief, right? Because if you've spent time in Russia living there as I have, you, you, you sort of understand that uh, Russian society is, is not entirely uh, devout, let's put it this way, right? So uh, on one hand, this is almost a farcical observation, but on the other hand, it's one that resonates with the far right in places like, among others, the United States. And I think this transnational dimension of uh, rhetorical flow is something that's very important to consider as well. I, I'm sorry, I feel like I haven't done this subject justice, but uh, yeah. I, maybe I hit the high points at least. <laughs> Well, actually you did, and I, I think you made one point, which I think is very, very important that we really did not talk about Ukraine. Uh, we did not talk also about the terrible tragedy which is happening as we speak. Uh, I would like to quote, uh, you know, my second boss in my long, uh, uh, you know, career, uh, Hedley Board, uh, pointing to the fundamental immorality of the subject matter of international studies, uh, summarized in his uh, famous uh, dictum, uh, states do not die, only people do, and only people cry. And you know, and that is, uh, you know, the cost uh, of all of these grand schemes and so on. And uh, you know, and with your suggestion that we have got to be much, much more transnational, and detach from, from the uh, Westphalian creation of these political entities, which are you know, really still uh, justified uh, uh, to do organized uh, crime, we could say, uh, kill people. You know? and that, that is what I think is terrible. Six million people from Ukraine uh, lost their home, never will see their husbands, and the estimates of the human cost on both Russian and Ukraine side. Uh, this is not really the end of uh, this event. You could argue that, that uh, we uh, made a mistake that we have actually invited so many members, but I think it, because we could actually have spent one, uh, one and a half hour with each of you separately. But I think the virtue of it 
is um, to put together precisely this to show that there are so many perspectives. And uh, we are not done as far as uh, uh, Sara, the organizer, uh, is concerned because she uh, plans to actually publish somewhere on the ISA website a summary of what we have done. Uh, I would like also to add a reading list uh, where I would highlight uh, you know, the works which I have, which led me to inviting many of you. <coughs> and um, also we uh, will have a, um, a YouTube presentation, which she confidently expects will have uh, quite, a large, quite a large audience as uh, the ISA YouTube, uh, you know, usually do have. Uh, I know that there were some questions, but we probably are already uh, four minutes past the, past the point, but we will uh, see each other in Montreal. Uh, I know that uh, Jocelyn would, would like to speak, uh, but, uh, and uh, uh, Jocelyn, in fact, and many of you will be on that panel in Montreal, and hopefully it will be a post-mortem of the war, which, uh, you know, makes me an optimist. But as Gorbachev said in one of his last interviews, he said, I was born an optimist, but it's very difficult to be an optimist these days. That was about three years before his death. So with that said, unless somebody has got something, uh, some other dictum to, to trump my quotation of Hedley Bo, uh, I would like to uh, pass the buck to to uh, Sara, because she is the organizer of all of it, whether she thinks that this is the end, or what do we do now? So that's, thank you everybody for an amazing discussion. Um, I will send you all the YouTube video when it is ready and please email me with any resources that you would like me to include on the resource list that we're putting together. And that's it for now. And thank you to all the attendees. Bye everybody. Thank you very much. Thanks.